Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for coming along tonight. It's pretty cold out there, so we really appreciate that you've, uh, you've made the effort. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's David Harding. I'm the Deputy Head of Curriculum Operations. Just started at Cadinia this year and um, really enjoying being part of this amazing community. So tonight's the uh, Year 10 into Senior Pathway Information Evening. And, uh-oh, technical issues already. There we go, there we're right. So before we get started, um, we just need to do our acknowledgement to country. Um, so I'd like to just take a moment to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today, the Wadarung people of the Kulin Nation. And I think given that we're in a school and we're talking about educational pathways, it's really fitting to um, acknowledge the original educators of this land. So I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, uh, for they hold the memories, the traditions, culture and the hopes of all the Aboriginal people. So tonight's an opportunity for you to get some information that your children hopefully got on Tuesday morning when we went through the information session about all of the senior programs that we offer here at the school and then there was a little bit more time for the students to um, start thinking about their course planning and, and where they're going. So tonight you'll get the same information and, and I do hope that the kids have gone home and had a little bit of a chat with you um, about that tonight. So you'll hear from uh, Miss Arnold who's our VCE coordinator. Um, you'll also hear from Mr Wigglesworth who's our VET or our Vocational Education and Training uh, Coordinator. Miss Howard will talk about the IB and then Miss Flack who's our Head of Careers will talk a little bit about um, supporting your, your children in planning the course. And then our plan at the end is rather than open up um, for questions with such a large group, it can be a bit confronting to ask those questions, we'll break up into smaller areas down here on the floor where you'll have an opportunity to ask questions um, to the relevant people who, who are supervising those programs. But before we get into that, just a little bit of a look at the journey that the students have been on to get to this point. Um, it, it was pretty evident on Tuesday morning that a lot of the stuff that we were presenting, the kids already had some level of understanding about, and that's had a lot to do with the work that we've done over the last couple of years. So about 18 months ago, when the, when the students were in year nine, we started talking to them and developing um, their career action plan. And, and that was looking at strengths, looking at interests, uh, and then doing the Morrisby profile to have a look at um, really sort of focusing in on those strengths and interests and looking at future opportunities. So the students have been thinking in this space for the last 18 months. And that brings us up to the middle of that slide where we are now, which is the Year 10 um, Information Week. And this, this is the end of, of that week. The <coughs> online form opened yesterday, so students should be able to access those and start putting their, their program together. Um, and that will close on the 9th of August. So it's a really important deadline for students and we'll come back to that at the end. After that, we will email out the subject selections as they are to you as parents, so you've got an idea and just to make sure that you're aware of what the, the students have selected. And then we run an interview week where every student will have the opportunity to speak to a member of the senior school and just review that program. If there are any changes, we'll then email those out to you uh, again and then confirm courses later on. So that's, that's the timeline, but we will come back and just um, go through that a little bit more at the end. I'm going to hand over to Miss Arnold now, who's going to go talk us through the um, VCE. Hi everyone, um, welcome and thank you for coming. Uh, my name is uh, Brooke Arnold, I'm the VCE coordinator here at Cadinia. Um, and hopefully tonight I'll just be able to uh, go through some of the VCE um, and get, hopefully give you a bit more of an understanding about um, what your child will be going through over the next two years. <clears throat> so um, the Victorian Certificate of Education is the main secondary school certificate that you can gain in Victoria. Um, of course, we've got the IB here as well, which Ainsley will talk about. Um, but the VCE includes units for, that are subject based here at Cadinia, the VCE subjects, but we also offer VET subjects as well, which um, are offered outside of the college, but do contribute to the VCE certificate. So that is something certainly that um, your child might want to consider doing, and Paul will talk more about that. Um, so the VCE certificate is completed over two years. Um, many students have already begun that process um, by doing a one-two subject early. All right, so to talk more about that, um, our unit one-two subjects are offered 
usually in year 11. Um, as I said before, some of them start in year 10. Um, and they are independent of each other. So whilst it is preferred that they do a unit one, two, three, four sequence, um, there is some scope in year 11 to change if it is necessary. So it's not necessarily recommended for some, for some subjects um, that you pick up a unit two. Um, so for example, um, chemistry or physics, if you haven't done unit one, it wouldn't be recommended that you pick up a unit two. Um, it's just very, very difficult. Um, but there can be some other changes that can take place. So they are independent of each other, um, but the three fours must be completed in a sequence. Okay, so they can't be changed once you're in it. Uh, you're, you're basically in it for the rest of the year. So our year 11 students, they will complete seven subjects in year 11 if they are not accelerating. Our year 10 students who have completed one subject early. Um, we'll go on it and do that as a three, four. Three, four subjects have five periods a week instead of four. So that limits their um, ability to do uh, more one, two units. So they end up doing five unit one, two subjects plus their three, four subject. That allows them to have a few free periods just to um, get on top of their year 12 work. Um, so once we finish year 11, we then go on to our unit three, four courses. Um, and they, as I said before, they need to be studied in a sequence. So unit three followed by unit four in the same subject. And typically our year 12 students will complete five subjects in year 12. Um, so those year, 11 sub, uh, those year 11 students that have done a subject early, that becomes their sixth subject, which is a really big advantage um, to the students' ATAR. All right, so we, re we do recommend and we try to make sure that all students um, basically do finish with five, uh, six subjects. Um, up on the board, there is so many subjects in which our Year 11s can choose from. So there's heaps and heaps up there. All right, I'm not going to read them all out. I'll just give you a minute or so to have a look through those subjects. That automatically changed on me. I don't know why. Um, I'll just go back to that. There we go. All right, you'll notice there that there is EAL, that's English as an additional language, and there are some requirements um, to fulfill um, for EAL. Um, it is seven years, so you can't have an education in English for longer than seven years to be eligible for EAL. One of the advantages of um, VCE, I guess, is that you can choose and build a course that suits you um, in a specialised area. You can choose to do a mixed course um, and do French, PE, economics, methods, psychology, however you like, how, or you might decide that, okay, I'm a really math science -y person, I'm not really an all-rounder, um, so I'm gonna do a maths science course. So I might choose um, more of your sciences, like chemistry, physics, um, you might do maths methods, um, specialist maths. The only real requirement for any of these courses that they choose is English, um, now, from the English group, that can be English, literature, or EAL. Okay, but you have to do English units one, two, three, and four. All right, so um, in VCE, in terms of assessment, assessment is spread out. Um, so in year 11, they do uh, SACs or assessments, and these are these don't contribute. So units one and two don't contribute to an ATAR score, but they do contribute to whether they pass or fail the subject. So um, 
So those are set by the class teachers, our internal assessments, and usually there's probably um, five or six assessments across the year, um, major assessments. Those um, SACs might be essays, they might be questions, they might be tests, they might be pracs. The other one is our SATs. Now SATs are completed as prac, so it might be something like building um, something for product design, often a very long-term project. Um, so those are sort of done in year 11, but also we do those in year 12, and that is when they are scored assessments. So they actually get a grade and a score that will contribute to their ATAR. Now all of those assessments have set dates um, and, those, and the students must meet those set dates. Our external assessments, um, these are related to units three and four. Um, so we've got the GAT. Now all students, whether they are in year 11 completing a three, four subject or in year 12, completing a 3-4 subject, must sit the GAT. Okay, so um, they might be studying one unit 3-4 subject in year 11, they still have to sit the GAT. Um, and then, of course, they've got their exams at the end of the year. So usually there is one exam per subject at the end of the year, and that just examines the year 12 content. All right, and those dates are set by VCAR. All right, so to be eligible for your actual VCE certificate, the students must complete a minimum of 16 and pass a minimum of 16 subjects. Now, we do exceed that here at Cadinia, um, and most students will finish with about 24 subjects. Oh, uh, sorry, so, so not subjects, units. All right, so, but the minimum pass is 16. They must complete four units of English, EAL or literature, um, and they must satisfactorily pass at least three others. So as I said, that, well, that is, is four. Most of our students will end up with six. One of the biggest things here is attendance. Um, and we don't really have too many issues with attendance, but um, I think you should be certainly aware that there is a minimum attendance of 80%. And, um, it does put students at risk of not being able to pass if they can't uh, meet that requirement. Oops. <clears throat> All right, so here's just a bit of a summary of the expectations we have here at Cadinia for our VCE students. Um, we've got our year tens. Um, so if those that aren't accelerating, we'll study our seven subjects at year 11 and then five at year 12. Our year 10 students who have perhaps done a unit one, two subject early, they will study three, uh, sorry, unit, their unit three, four course early and five other unit one, two subjects. Now those unit one, two subjects are usually the five that they carry through to year 12. So it's kind of important that they get it right. Um, uh, there are a couple of students, there's not too many, but there are a few students who do complete too early um, and they complete four um, subjects of Unit 1-2 in Year 11. And they may study four subjects at, at Year 12, but they also may study five. Okay. So at the end of that, um, they will achieve 24 VCE credits. All right, so that's all from me. Um, Mr Wigglesworth, who is our uh, VET coordinator and my, uh, the assistant VCE coordinator, um, he'll come and talk to you about VET. All right, but if you've got any questions, I know I went through that really, really quickly, um, please ask me at the end. Thanks. Good evening and welcome again. Um, so I'm going to talk about vocational education and training, or VET for short, so that will be what I'll talk about. Um, I suppose VET is an opportunity for school students to experience something which isn't your traditional academic subjects within the context of school. They get a, an opportunity to perhaps sample a trade or a particular industry, 
um, which allows them to almost make more educated decisions about where their career path might be uh, leading to. Um, it typically runs over two years, and as you can see on the screen, it does talk about the fact that those two years can be a year 10 into a year 11 sequence or a year 11 into a year 12 sequence. For instance, there will be some students perhaps in the room that are already currently doing a VET. Um, that actually gives them an opportunity to do a second VET course in their 11 and 12 years on top of that 10 and 11 years. So that's something that might be up for consideration as well. Uh, the classes generally run on a Wednesday or a Monday after, uh, afternoon between 1.30 and 5.30. So there is a, a requirement for them to dedicate some outside of school time to actually complete their, their VET course. Uh, but generally what happens is around about lunchtime, one o'clock, uh, Cadinia transports the students to the particular venues that might be running those uh, courses. And then obviously they work through to about 5, 5.30 at which point uh, a parent would be required to, to pick them up from that venue. Um, the other thing it does allow students to do is perhaps do some uh, structured workplace learning, in other words, work experience as such. So again, another opportunity to see what the real world is like in that regard. Um, and I suppose one of the big ones for parents, and it's in on the screen there, is that because we are federally funded, the state government doesn't give us any funding for VET courses. So unlike uh, government schools, unfortunately it is a, a user pay system. And that user pay system could equate to, well it does equate approximately to an extra 2000 to $3,500 fees each year of the VET course. So that is obviously a consideration for parents to take into account as well. Uh, some of the benefits of um, the VET is that it obviously, again, does allow students to experience direct work placement context and, and learning from that. Um, it can con uh, contribute to your VC certificate and it can also contribute to your ATAR score uh, in terms of perhaps getting into university at the end. And there'll be some more details about that a little later on. Um, if you know anything about the ATAR score, in general, the ATAR score and I don't want to um, um, take Danny's uh, thunder here, she'll talk about that a bit later on, but it basically requires you to do four subjects, which count as your primary four towards your ATAR score, and then a fifth and sixth subject allows you to get bonuses. Um, some VET subjects have exams, some VET subjects don't have exams. The ones that have exams count like any other VC subject within the VC8. So, you will do the exams, you will get a score, it will get used as part of the calculation for perhaps an ATAR score. If it's one of your best four subjects, it's in the primary four. If it's not, it's your fifth or sixth subject. Um, if we think about last year's cohort, our best score in a VET subject was 44 out of 50, which is pretty high. It means you're in the top three or four percent of the state. Um, the average for a VET subject was 33, so again, a pretty good performance. So I'd like to kind of dispel the idea that maybe you do VET if you're not particularly academic. It does have that academic uh, uh, part to it as well. Um, probably of, of we, we only had six students actually do what we call scored assessment last year in VET. Three of them, it was their best score of any subject they were doing at school. Okay, and when you look at that primary four in terms of the best four subjects they've done, for two of those three, it was their second best subject out of all their selection, and for the, the third one, it was their fourth best subject. So all of them had it in their primary four as far as their ATAR calculation. So I would encourage you to consider VET in the sense that it will contribute uh, collectively quite well to, to the ATAR score. Um, 10% sorry, um, if it's not a scored assessment, so it doesn't have exams, it can still count towards your ATAR score in the sense that it will be classified as your fifth or sixth subject, and that will give you a 10% increment. Again, Danny will talk of that a bit later on. The advantage of doing a VET as your fifth subject is because there's no exam, there's no score to calculate from in terms of what the contribution is. And so what they do is they take the bottom subject of your top four, so they take your fourth best subject, 
and do a 10% calculation on that score as your bonus. As opposed to if it was just a normal VCE one, it would be 10% of your fifth best score. So again, VET actually has a little bit of an advantage there that it, if it's unscored, it will always be your best fifth subject no matter what you are doing at school. So again, it can help you out in, in that way if you're looking to boost your ATAR score a little bit. Um, it does allow you to obviously have on-the-job training and, and again uh, allows for that. Uh, importantly, VC subjects can get an early taster of their career path and it facilitates the process of a fully formed in de decision, I suppose, on the possible career path, which can be good or bad. Sometimes it confirms what, that, what the st uh, student is thinking is the way they're going to go. Other times it might say, I didn't really think this through and it wasn't really the thing I thought it would be. So again, as a positive, I've got time to change my mind and, and, and go in a different direction. Uh, on the screen there, you'll see a, quite a selection of various different industry, um, I suppose, areas that we offer VET courses in. Um, they are kind of the generalised headings. There's more specifics behind that, which you can find both on the Bridges website and on our Kick Online VET page, which I'll mention a bit later on. But, for instance, art, design, fashion could, impl uh, could be applied fashion design. Um, construction, licensed trades, yes, carpentry, that kind of thing, plumbing, electricians but also furniture making. Uh, something else, uh, perhaps uh, performance, dance, music, sound production within music, various different areas that you could actually uh, look into for a VET subject. If you're considering a VET subject, it is important to take note of, of those times and days. Um, we've already mentioned that the deadline for um, subject selections within the school is the 9th of August. VET beats to its own drum in the sense that we are relying on other institutions to actually take our students on in terms of their training. So we have to uh, coordinate both with other schools and places like the Gordon Tafe and, 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 and stuff like that. So the deadline I would really like you to pay attention to in terms of VET is in that middle one, you can see that the latest deadline is the 8th of September to get an application in. But in all honesty, if you put your application in on the 7th of September, you are very unlikely to be awarded your VET subject. It will be full already. They would have started to make decisions and they would have been already snowed under with applicants. And so you will be at the bottom of the, of the list. For year 10s, going into year 11, the one underneath that 8th of September date the fact that it opens on the 1st of August, ideally I'd love to see applications coming in on the 1st, 2nd, 3rd of August. The 15th of August is actually for year 9s going into year 10s. They're staggered a little bit compared to the current year 10 cohort just to give the year 10s a little bit of priority in terms of they need it for their year 11 and 12 kind of pathway. Um, I think I've said everything else in terms of that one, in terms of uh, the kind of things that happen with that. Um, you can get more information and obviously come speak to myself at the end of today, but there is a kick online vet page which both students and parents should be able to access. On there it gives you details about those individual possible vet subjects where that subject is offered, is it at the Gordon or one of our other schools, the arrangements for applying, if it's at the Gordon, the way you apply is actually go onto the Gordon's website and actually uh, fill in their application form online. If it's any other organisation, it's a paper slash electronic form, which I have access to, which students will fill in, parents will sign, it comes back via me and then I send it out to the relevant institution. So it's a two-fold uh, application process depending on where you are applying to. You can apply to more than one place and for multiple subjects if you want, but within our timetable we can only run one course per year for a particular student. The, um, the other thing to point out is that application process is separate to our subject selections process. Uh, Mr. Harding and Mr. Hick will expect those subject selection pro, uh, uh, applications to come in 
uh, on that uh, 9th of August or before. On that form, a student will be required to say, I'm applying for a VET course as well as hopefully doing these VCE courses. That sometimes stops there because the student doesn't realise that they have to do this application to the Gordon or the, um, the other institution through myself at the same time. Okay? So please keep that in mind if you are considering applying. The, um, the other thing I would say about that is we cannot guarantee a student will get into that VET subject. So you should really have a backup plan, either a second VET subject that I might try and get into as well, or you know, this is going to be my VCE program without a VET course in there, this is going to be my VCE program with a VET course in there, because it's really important that it's really out of our control as to whether a student gets accepted into these courses. And it obviously relies a little bit on supply and demand from all the schools and the training organisations. Okay. Uh, the other place you can find information in the same regard is the Bridges website, so I still encourage you to go on there as well. I think it's time for me to hand over to uh, Ainsley, and she'll talk about the IB programme. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program. Uh, we've been offering it now for a number of years at Cadinia, and it's a really successful and um, well-run program with uh, lots of support from fantastic staff um, who really enjoy what they're teaching. So the IB Diploma Program was um, actually instigated in around about the 1960s and it was born of the need to cater for families that were travelling frequently internationally and moving from country to country and are finding it quite difficult uh, for their children to actually transition from country to country and all the different local educational programs that were offered in each of those countries. So uh, um, an international curriculum was established. It's been built on over all of those years and really refined um, and expanded upon um, to have the program that we have today. So basically, what does the IB diploma offer for our students? Well, it offers a holistic approach it expects them to study subjects from a range of different uh, subject groupings. So they are looking at a language, they are studying a humanities, they're undertaking a science and a mathematics. Um, it also gives them uh, globally recognised assessments, um, which is um, helpful in the ease of transitioning into universities and college, whether that is here in Australia or in other countries around the world. Um, one of the things that students um, often ask me a lot of questions about is the attractive ATAR conversion that they get here in the state of Victoria. Um, and it is an attractive uh, conversion. Basically, um, the diploma is, uh, is made up of 45 points. To gain your diploma, you need a minimum of 24 points gained over that time and the conversion to an ATAR here in Victoria on that minimum 24 points is a 70 ATAR currently. So basically the diploma, um, as I said before, is a holistic approach and we like to help the students take a pathway of learning a lot about themselves over time. So it's not just the six subjects they study in class, it's also undertaking three core components outside of that, uh, which is theory of knowledge, that's built into their timetable, an extended essay, that's a 4,000 word research um, component on a subject of their choosing, an area of passion or interest, and they also do CAS, which is creativity, activity and service, and that's around about 18 months of engagement in community service work um, and, and partaking in all sorts of different sporting activities, um, learning musical instruments and, and helping out around the college. So students will choose six subjects um, from what we offer in all the different groupings. Three of those subjects need to be taken at a higher level and three of those at a standard level. The difference between those are that a standard level subject 
requires around about 150 hours of tuition over the two year period. And a higher level course is around about 240 hours of class time over the two years. Of course, with additional content to what you're learning at a standard level. Okay, so there's a couple of extra units of work that are addressed in the higher level courses. Um, theory of knowledge, as I said before, is on the timetable. They do three periods of theory of knowledge a week in year 11, and that's reduced down to one period a week in year 12 when they're just undertaking the main essay assessment for year 12. So they're covering a lot of the content in the first year and then looking at just the uh, essay in year 12. The extended essay is around about a six month duration. We're about to start that with our year 11s currently in term three. They'll have that submitted next year in uh, term one as year 12 students. Uh, we do a range of workshops. We teach them how to create a research question and go about inquiring into that. Um, doing a whole broad range of research uh, through libraries, working with a mentor, looking online, and, and then producing a 4,000 word document. They can uh, take subjects in the extended essay that are outside their coursework, so outside their timetable. Uh, we don't actually offer philosophy here as a course. However, some students uh, like to choose philosophy as their EE topic uh, or subject area. Uh, creativity activity services, I said, um, some of the students were asking lots of questions about this on Tuesday and, and sort of asking how it fits into their world and does it make things really busy um, outside of school as well. And we sort of went through all the different things that CAS involves and they could already be playing a sport each week. That contributes to CAS. They might be learning a musical instrument that contributes to CAS. They might be part of our Earth Corps here at school. They might be part of our so social justice committee. Um, so they all contribute towards their CAS. Every student will take on one major project and that's around about 30 hours of work. Um, some of the major projects that we have running at the moment, uh, next Thursday evening, a whole lot of year 11s will be staying behind for the whole night outside doing the Vinnie's winter sleep out where we're raising funds for homelessness in our area. We support other organisations locally like Geelong Mums, um, have students working in op shops like St Vinnie's and contribute where they see a need as well or an area of interest. So basically the breakdown of scoring for the diploma is that every subject, so six subjects, is worth a possible seven points. Um, to sort of equate that in terms of letter grading, a 7 is your equivalent to an A+. Uh, so each subject worth 7 is 42 possible points in the IB. And the three remaining points come from a combination of the work that they do in theory of knowledge and their extended essay. So um, they might um, get an A for theory of knowledge for their essay and the exhibition that they need to do, combined with an A for their extended essay, and that works together for those three bonus points. An A and a B combination in TOC and EE will give them three bonus points to add on to their scores for their subjects. Uh, it's really important to note um, that the diploma does require that minimum of 24 points in order to pass the diploma. They also must pass theory of knowledge and they must pass the extended essay. So if they are awarded a letter grade of E for either TOC or for extended essay, um, it's actually a failing condition of the course. So in combination with their 24 points, they also need to pass those two components. And we work really rigorously with the students to ensure that um, that doesn't happen. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's also up to the students to, um, to produce that work. So our groupings um, on offer, are, our group one subjects are the Englishes and we have two different courses here at Cadinia. The first one is English Literature. You're studying around about 10 novels, quite often they're classic works of literature uh, and there's works of poetry that are also covered in that two years. The language and literature course 
is um, fairly new. We've been doing it for about five or six years now. And that entails basically two units or half of the course is your sort of standard English that the students are doing now uh, throughout year 10. Um, and we, we look at um, classic literature, we look at poetry, but we also look at all sorts of other forms of text or modes, uh, things like social media platforms, YouTube, uh, journals, blogs, um, all the different ways that language is conveyed and messages are conveyed in our changing world. Group two is our language acquisition and um, students can study French and Japanese from year seven here at the school and those students who have continued with that language learning of French and Japanese can continue that through their IB diploma. Uh, however, um, if they haven't continued with their language learning and they'd like to do the IB, we offer two courses uh, at ab initio, which means beginner language. So Spanish and German are beginner language courses here in the IB. Uh, some of our students who have continued with Japanese and French to the end of year 10 might also opt to do Spanish or German just as a, a different sort of area of interest or to try something new and that's completely fine as well. Group three is our humanities section. We have history, psychology, global politics and business management. Uh, group four, sciences, biology, chemistry, physics, sports, exercise and health science. Group five, mathematics is another one that I get a lot of questions about. We have three different maths courses in the IB uh, and to probably explain it a little more clearly. The applications and interpretations course, the standard level, is the sort of entry level maths into the IB diploma. That's equivalent fairly similar to general maths in VCE. I would say it's similar with maybe a, a unit or two extra detail on that, okay? Uh, the analysis, analysis and approaches SL course is equivalent to math methods in VCE. And then you have your higher level uh, uh, analysis and approaches. That's your specialist mathematics in VCE with an extra unit or two added on. Um, Quite, quite a rigorous course for that one. Um, as a prerequisite in year 10, we have instructed students uh, all year and even at the year nine program last year, if they're looking to do the IB, they really need to be studying MAD 10 and MAD 20 in maths in year 10, which will help prepare them for applications and interpretations. If they're studying level E mathematics, or early entry mathematics, uh, math methods in VCE, units one and two this year, they can um, choose to do HL or SL um, and we can guide them through that and give them a little bit more direction and um, talk them through all the different maths there. Of course, it will also come down to prerequisites for university courses, so we need to make sure that that's um, the right maths that they're enrolled in as well. Group six is the arts. Uh, we offer film and visual arts for next year. However, in group six, we also offer chemistry, biology, and global politics. So a number of years ago, the IB identified that students who are wishing to pursue uh, university studies in things like medicine and engineering really needed two sciences. Uh, so they can do one of the sciences in group four, and they can pick up a second science in group six or for those students that are pursuing arts degrees and really enjoy and are strong at the humanities, they can now choose a humanities in group three or a humanities in group six and they don't have to undertake a, an arts course if they don't wish. Okay, so the assessment, similar to VCE, you have internal assessment and external assessment. So Differently, however, to VCE, the internal assessment isn't just done in one period where you're learning the content and then sitting that paper and then leaving the content behind to move on. We actually work on a drafting process. So every subject they will do what's called an IA and that will generally be for English as an oral, for their languages they do an oral, uh, for science 
it's an investigative report, so they're looking at something and, and performing some experiments and putting together a 12-page paper on that, which is done over a period of time. Uh, it's drafted, you consult with your class teacher, your class teacher annotates your work, provides feedback, and you get to go away and refine that work before we submit it and upload it. Um, the external assessments are exams at the end of Year 12. Um, there is at least two exams for many subjects and some subjects like science or high level maths will have three exams. So a, an IB student can be sitting anywhere between 12 and 15 exams in their three week exam period um, at the end, but they're very well prepared um, for that um, and had lots of practice for it too. Okay, just to be really aware, the additional costs involved in the IB program is that there is approximately a thousand dollar fee which gets charged to school accounts in year 12 and that goes directly to the IBO. That is their fee for the administration of the exam. So it's not a school fee, it's one that gets paid directly to the IBO um, and then each, each student will also uh, pay for the gap whether you're doing VCE or IB. Okay. So, um, I'll hand over to Danny and I'm around after the presentation to answer any questions and have some conversations with you, but thanks for listening. Okay, so you've obviously had a lot of information already presented to you tonight and my job is to help guide you as to what to do with all of that information and how to make some really important decisions going forward. So when we're thinking about making a decision about year 11 and 12, it's almost counterproductive, but we actually need to fast forward to life beyond school. So we do need to start to think about what destination does your child want to achieve once they do finish here with us. Um, for some students, that might be a direct entry into the workforce. For others, it might be an apprenticeship or traineeship. And some of our other students might be considering TAFE or university. So we really do encourage them to start to think about how can they prepare themselves in year 11 and 12 so that they can get to that destination after school. Probably the most significant um, decision and the one that's going to have the, the most consequences is for those students who are considering going to university. Um, and for those students, it's, their decision shouldn't be limited by whether or not they decide to do VC or they decide to do the IB. So one of the things that's really reassuring, I think, is that whether students decide to do VC or IB, they can feel assured that if they pass those programs, they will have entrance to university. So whether that is here in Australia, in Victoria, or internationally as well. So the outcome for both of those problem, uh, sorry, programs, not problems, programs is actually the same. Um, we also really need to be mindful of the fact that many university courses do have prerequisites. And when we talk about prerequisites, we're talking about minimum entry requirements. For all courses in Victoria and across Australia, there is one prerequisite that they have in common, and that is English. And that's why all students are required to do English in BCE, and they will obviously do that too as part of the IB program. Some courses will have a second prerequisite, and that's generally in the maths or the science area. So we do really need to be quite mindful of checking those prerequisites. Some courses, and I will say it's a very small number of courses, will have a third prerequisite. And again, that is usually a maths or a science. Students have been um, presented with the information about prerequisites and they've been emailed that information. And that is provided to them by VTAC, which is the Victorian Tertiary Admissions Centre. And they develop that document in consultation with universities. So at the moment, students will be looking at the 2026 VTAC prerequisite guide, and it will contain all of the information that they need to know about what is required for them for minimum entrance when they are thinking about applying for university. This is in addition to their minimum ATAR score as well, which obviously fluctuates from year to year, but you can have a look at what the ATAR um, as a minimum requirement was in the previous year. Just being mindful that some courses do fluctuate 
um, and some change quite significantly, just depending on things like um, availability of numbers in the course, availability of um, placements, and if the government has changed the funding for that course. When we're talking about other requirements, there will be courses that may have minimum subjects, may have a minimum ATAR, but they might also require other things for students to complete. So for courses in the creative arts area, students might be required to complete a selection task, a folio. Um, some students might be required to attend an interview or complete an audition. Students who are considering um, pursuing a career in teaching, and we do need lots of teachers, so we'd encourage that, um, also need to complete the CASPA, which is um, a suitability to teach assessment, which is done online. People who are thinking about doing nursing and midwifery also need to undertake an English language proficiency assessment. And for students who um, have been educated in an English language school, it only takes about two or three minutes, but it's extremely important that they do that. So, as I mentioned before, um, it is absolutely important that students are conscious of prerequisites and they are making sure that they're enrolling in those correct subjects. In the area of maths, in particular, students need to make sure that they are enrolling in the correct level of maths um, and having a good look through those prerequisites to make sure that it's not just across the board in terms of prerequisites. So if you're looking at biomedicine at one university, it doesn't necessarily mean that that prerequisite will also apply in the same course at a different university. So just making sure you're looking at a variety of different um, offerings. Question we get quite often is what is the ATAR? It is not a percentage, um, it is a ranking. So uh, as Paul was mentioning earlier, the ATAR is derived from an aggregate score. And that aggregate score is calculated when students get a study score at the end of their 3-4 sequence. A minimum students will need to have the four 3-4 sequences in order to calculate their ATAR. One of those subjects must be English and the other three are made up of the highest uh, study scores that students achieve. Students, so that whole study score out of 50 will contribute to the aggregate. If students have a fifth and a sixth subject, they will get 10% of that score, which is also added to their aggregate. They'll end up with a score out of 210, and then that is used to rank them against other students who have completed VCE in the same year as them. So if a student gets a 95 as their ATAR, it means that they've, they've ranked in the top 5% of their cohort for that year. The great thing about the ATAR is that it is an Australian ranking. So whether they're studying here in Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, or that they want to apply interstate, that score can be used for admission. And I know for a lot of our students, that's really important to know because we do have students who um, are interested in applying in different states. And we've already been through this one. So when we're thinking about subject selection, I think it's really important to note that every single student will have a different pathway. And it is really important that they are making choices based on what they're passionate about, what they're interested in, what they feel that they excel in, and something that's really going to suit their learning style. We have students who are successful at our college, whether they do VC or they do IB. We have successful students who do VET programs. And they are successful because they found something that allows them to accelerate and showcase their talents and their interests. And I think that that's really an important thing that we need to keep in mind when we're making our subject choices. Obviously, you need to be aware of the prerequisites. So we need to be thinking ahead to what might be an option after year 12. But we'd encourage students not to think too narrowly. What we know is that people change their mind. Students come across careers over the next two years that they didn't know exist previously. And we don't want them to cut off that as an opportunity. So we want them to think about several different careers or perhaps a whole industry that they might be interested in and think about what's going to help them get there. It is about being curious and it is about exploring options. Um, also, being quite conscious of what you are capable of. So whilst we might think it's a great idea to get into specialist maths because 
of a whole variety of different reasons. Maybe we think it could be scaled up. Maybe we think um, it will look appealing on a university application. If it's not a strength for you, if you don't have strong study habits, um, perhaps you're not excelling in maths at the moment, you have to really think about whether or not that's going to be a good choice. So we do ask students to reflect a lot about their learning, talk to their subject teachers, um, and get that advice and feedback so they can make a good decision. So where to from here? Um, obviously Bridges is a, the document that you need to be having a look at. Really carefully thinking about the subjects that are on offer um, and thinking about which learning pathway might be best suited to your child's learning style. Having a look at the prerequisite guide that has been sent to students in an email and it's also available on the Kick Online Careers page um, to be able to, for all students to be able to access. Um, and that is published by the Victorian Tertiary Admissions Centre. So we know that this is good quality, reliable information. As I said before, talking to subject teachers, it's absolutely vital. They know your child really well in that subject area and they can offer you some really good advice about where they think the next step is for your child. Attending physical open days. It feels amazing to be able to say that this year all open days are on campus and they actually start this Sunday. So they start a little bit earlier this year and they will run every Sunday until the end of August. Um, again, that information has been published, so it's on the Kick Online Careers um, news feed as well. And we would really encourage students to get out there and explore campuses for themselves. We would encourage you to register um, and attend as many different workshops as you can. Find out about careers that you'd never even heard of before. The worst thing that could happen is that you realise it's not something you're interested in and you can cross it off your list. But you might also discover something that you are surprised by and it might spark interest for you that you didn't know. Um, and then obviously be ready. Be ready to submit your subject selection. If you have a question, ask your tutor group teacher. Come and see us at lunchtime, before school or after school. Um, often we can answer your question in a couple of minutes or we can point you in the right direction really quickly. So there's no point in holding on to your question until the last day or avoiding it, perhaps is more accurate. Uh, come and ask us, come and see, we can help you with that. The other really important thing is that all of our students have access to their Morrisby profile. So that was completed in year nine and we have revisited it this year. We would encourage students to jump back on and have another look. There are a whole heap of career suggestions in there and students have identified between five and seven different careers that they're interested in exploring further. That also contains a pathways guide in there. So a guide to what subjects should students should be doing or could be doing in year 10, 11 and 12 and then beyond school as well. So it's an extremely useful resource. The Morrisby profile also provides uh, a list of suggested VCE and IB subjects that are aligned to the student's um, academic profile. So again, I'd encourage students to jump on and revisit that document. We also have a Cadenia's Careers website. It's Careers at Cadenia, so it's pretty easy to find. Um, there's a whole heap of information on there, not just for students, but also for parents. You actually get your own drop down menu with lots of different information and resources in there. Um, when we're thinking about what's right for me, as I mentioned before, we have successful students across all of our programs and that success is about finding the right pathway for you. So there is no point in going into the IB program just because you think you're going to get a high ATA and as Ainsley mentioned, yes, that conversion can be great. But if that program did not sound appealing to you, then it may not be the right choice and please don't do it just for that ATAR. We have extremely successful students who do VET, we have extremely successful students who do VCE. So find that program that's going to allow you to experience that success. I will pass it back now to David, thank you. Okay, um, so just in terms of the presentation, we will share this on the website so that this information is, uh, is available for you to come back to. 
Uh, in terms of where to from here, um, the most important thing is for students now to start having a look at that electronic course selection form and starting to put some things in. So the 9th of August is a really key date that we need students to have entered in their course preferences. As I said, from that point, we will send an email home to parents and you'll receive that so you can check and make sure that you're aware of the choices that have been made. And then students will have the opportunity to sit down with staff and go through through those as a bit of a final check and we'll ask some questions and, and check how the students will be going in their subjects and really just make sure that they're, they're making good choices. And again, once those, um, those subjects have been finalised, we'll email that to the homes to families again so that you're um, completely aware of that. In terms of the course selection forms, and I know it's probably wishful thinking to think that students have had a go at this already, but when they do, there's seven VCE subjects that need to be entered. Um, if you're currently studying a one and two, make sure you roll that over into the three or three and four equivalent. Um, even though there are only six subjects for the IB that need to be picked, you'll still need to pick seven. Make sure one of those is the, um, is the theory of knowledge. And then the final piece there is just about that, that um, communication home. So before we move into questions, and we'll, we'll do that down here on the floor, can I ask you to please just thank the staff tonight who've um, taken the time to make those presentations. There's so much information that's been presented. A lot of it, as I said to the kids, is quite dry information, but I hope everyone feels confident knowing that um, the people in charge of these programs have that information and there's an amazing careers team um, to support the students as well. And I'll do a couple of introductions to people who haven't spoken. We've got Jo Madunik and uh, Manfred Pollance who are also here tonight to help out in terms of um, careers questions. So what we'll do, um, we'll get the program coordinators to come and stand up the front and if you've got a VCE question, a VET question or an IB question, you can um, reach the appropriate coordinator and we'll have the careers team just down the front. Um, you can ask questions around pre prerequisites and course planning 